We have some fast solar wind, a big flare player fires a parting shot, and a total solar eclipse of the sun. Those stories and more in the news this week. Ever dream of a career at the forefront of space and technology? Join us for the course Operational Space Weather Fundamentals in the historic heart of La Quila, Italy. This unique week-long program delivers cutting-edge space science with real-world applications for our modern age. Get hands-on laboratory training and make predictions alongside world-renowned experts. Network with future leaders while you gain state-of-the-art expertise that sets you apart and ready to address the needs of the rapidly emerging space sector. Midweek, take an adventurous tour to several medieval villages on the outskirts of L'Aquila. Refresh yourself with breathtaking landscapes and architectural wonders. Feel inspired for the future as you explore this region's rich past. Discover the impact of space weather on our world and become the pioneers of tomorrow. Sign up for Operational Space Weather Fundamentals today. Your journey begins now. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is calming down comparatively to the last week. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, the big flare players are exiting stage right as they rotate to the sun's far side, and that's leaving most of the disk completely clear. We've been following a few big solar storm launches like this one here that launched from the east limb, and also some filaments that look like they might have been erupting, but nope, they managed to rotate right through the Earth strike zone with nothing. But back to region 3615, look at that big plume right there. That was a near M class flare, or near X class flare, an M9.4 flare back on the 31st. It was a beautiful eruption, but did not give us that big of a solar storm. And what little it did give us is not Earth directed, but it did give us a near R3 level radio blackout. And amateur radio operators and emergency responders were definitely dealing with that. That was the parting shot that this region had before it completely left the west limb and rotated to the sun's far side. So we're going to be keeping our eyes on that one. Meanwhile, we've had a couple new emergences with active regions, but they're reasonably quiet thus far. And we do have this big coronal hole that we're paying attention to. This coronal hole is going to give us some fast solar wind here in about two to three days. And that means a possible uh, possibility for aurora right around the fourth or so. Sadly, it's not going to be timed with the uh, total eclipse on the 8th, but Aurora photographers, if you're at uh, high latitudes, you're definitely going to get a show, and even at mid-latitudes, you might get a chance for some Aurora, so that's something to look forward to. Now, as we take a look at our far-sided sun, we can no longer use Stereo A imagery to get a glimpse of what the far side looks like because Stereo A is staring at the same side of the sun that we are. So we have to use HIA or AIA and HMI imagery of about two weeks ago to get an idea of what's lurking on the sun's far side. And so as we set this in motion, I want you to pay attention not to region 3599, that one is actually kind of fizzled a little bit, but really region 3612. This is a region that only emerged on the sun's uh, west limb right before it rotated out of view. You can see it right there. That region has actually been growing on the sun's far side quite substantially. Now, as we pull up our JSOC HMI helioseismology far sided viewer, you can see region 3612 here growing on the west limb of the sun over this last rotation. Everything in the gold is on the far side of the sun. So you'll watch region 3612. This region is definitely growing right now on the sun's far side. And there's another region. We called it the new region. You can see part of it right here as well. These are two regions that we're interested in. Also, region 3621, which was a new region in between these big players here, this region was growing on the Earth side of the sun. You can see it there as it disappeared to the sun's west limb. This one is also one we're going to be watching. So we do have a few regions that are going to be entering into Earth view. Region, region 3612 is going to be the first one, along with its uh, companion, and then region 3607, which was also a big flare player. You can see it here with region 3613. So these regions are definitely going to be the ones to watch here over the next three to five days. And then, of course, region 34 uh, or 3614 and 15 
they're just beginning to make their, their way uh, across the sun's far side, and we're going to be keeping a very close eye on them. Are you ready for the total solar eclipse on April 8th? If you are anywhere in the northwestern hemisphere, look up and be amazed. This great eclipse will grace the skies over nearly the entire North American continent through the course of a full day on April 8th. An eclipse occurs when the moon crosses directly between the Earth and the sun, casting a shadow on the Earth below. Although eclipses happen often, they don't often occur over land, so it is a treat when we get to witness these spectacular celestial events. This great eclipse will begin over the coast of Mazatlan at approximately 11.07 a.m. Mountain Standard Time and proceed on a northeastward path through Mexico until it reaches the USA-Mexican border at Coahuila at 12.27 p.m. Central Daylight Time. It will then pass by San Antonio and Dallas, Texas, on its way northward through Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Tennessee, and Kentucky. By 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the moon shadow will be crossing over Indianapolis, Indiana, on its way to the Great Lakes. From there, it will cross through Ohio, Ontario, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine before completely crossing out of the USA, entering into New Brunswick, Canada at 3.32 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. From there, the eclipse will cross through Quebec, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador before ending the spectacular journey over the Atlantic at sunset. Test your skills of observation through citizen science opportunities at NASA. Activities include studying the changes in the sun's corona and comparing it to physics-based predictions like those found at Predictive Science you can see right here. Or for amateur radio operators, join the Festival of Eclipse QSO party at hamsci.org. But always remember to be safe while viewing the eclipse. Never look at it directly with your unprotected eyes or directly through binoculars, even if you're wearing the proper safety glasses because these weren't designed for that. For more information on how to safely view this spectacular event, be sure to check out NASA's 2024 Total Solar Eclipse Safety Sheet. Happy viewing. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being, of course, on the 8th, right before the total solar eclipse. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch some aurora, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora from the fast solar wind, well, now is your perfect chance. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth's strike zone. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active to minor storm conditions with up to about a 30 or 35% chance of a major storm, and that will likely be right around the 4th. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a chance to, to chase. Uh, and then things will definitely be calling, calming down right around the 5th into the 6th and completely quiet by the time we get to uh, the total solar eclipse. Now at mid-latitudes, well, we're not expecting quite as much. We have a wind watch on the 3rd, expecting probably active conditions on the 4th with about a 20 to 25% chance of a minor storm. And then that will settle down as we move into the 5th. And again, by the 6th, we'll be completely quiet. Uh, down with only about a 10% chance of active conditions. So perfect for the eclipse. Everything should be nice and calm. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting at about the 130s right now for solar flux. And this is a calm down quite a bit from last week. That's because big regions 36, 14, and 15 have rotated to the sun's far side. We are sitting at minor noise on the radio bands, the dayside radio bands. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you should probably hear a lot less noise on the bands this week. We've only got about a 10 to 20 percent chance of uh, M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout this week, and this is likely going to continue throughout the rest of this week. We might start seeing it rise just a little bit as we roll into the weekend, but prior to that, it should stay reasonably quiet, and we don't really have much of a chance for R3 ra radio blackouts at the, at the X-class flare. That's probably not going to be a big issue for us. So radio operators, enjoy this little respite. Probably next week, we will start getting a bit more noise on the bands, and we might get those big flare players back. Now, switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Well, everything is in the green this week. We are in the D1 normal range, and this is for uh, you aviators at flight level 360. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else, and we have a very low risk for radiation storms here over the rest of this week and likely into next week. We're probably going to stay pretty low. 
uh, until maybe the latter part of next week, we might see a little bit of a rise. So all you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high-risk passengers, you're all in the clear this week. So the space weather this week is calming down considerably compared to last week. Now we do have a coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone here over the next few days, and that's going to send us some fast solar wind. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely will get a show. Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, it probably are going to get a little bit of aurora, so it might be worth a look if you have clear skies. Now amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you know, right now we've got things are looking a lot better. Those big flare players have now rotated to the sun's far side. And although the solar flux has dropped a little bit, so has the noise on the dayside radio bands. So this is perfect when it comes to that total solar eclipse. If you happen to be working with HamSci or planning to do a little bit of a QSO party during that period, you might actually get to feel a bit more about what the eclipse does to the radio bands without having to worry about a solar storm or big solar flares mucking up all your data. So that is really good news. And now you GPS users, well, you know, everything is looking pretty good. We have a little bit of fast solar wind, so that might give you some trouble on the night side right around the 4th and the 5th. So if you're anywhere near Aurora, be sure to stay vigilant. But you know, on Earth's day side and near dawn and dusk, things should look pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.